Hi, this is Alyssa Lee, ministerial intern here at First Parish. We are so grateful to be a part of the First Parish community, and we just wanted to wish a very Merry Christmas from my family to yours. Merry, Merry Christmas! Merry Christmas. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Alyssa. And Merry Christmas to all of you from me, the Reverend Stephanie May, minister at First Parish. I hope that you all have a good holiday, and I hope that you enjoy this morning's service provided to you by my colleagues, the Reverend Heather Janulis and the Reverend Dr. Laura Solomon. Enjoy. Good morning. I am the Reverend Heather Janulis. I use the pronouns she, her, and hers. It is my honor to serve as the parish minister of the Winchester Unitarian Society in Winchester, Massachusetts. Our building stands near the shore of the Abergena River on land once stewarded by a coalition of indigenous tribes led by Nana Pashamet and his descendants. The Winchester Unitarian Society is but a short drive from the Unitarian Universalist Church of Reading. Both our congregations are close to many other Unitarian Universalist congregations and, as a friend of mine would say, a number of Stations of the Chalice, meaningful places in Universalist and Unitarian history. Whether you are attending the service alone or with others, at home or with your congregation, within the historic region of Eastern Massachusetts or somewhere across the country, I'm so glad we are joined through the interdependent web and this virtual connection for this time of worship. Welcome. Welcome. My name is Reverend Laura Solomon and my pronouns are she, her, and hers. I am so fortunate to serve as the contract minister for the wonderful people at the Unitarian Universalist Church of Reading, Massachusetts. And I am so glad we are joined this Christmas morning by so many of you around the country. It is a privilege to serve our faith and the world with you. Together, wherever you are and whenever you are watching this, we will take a breath bringing ourselves fully into this worshipful space.
Our opening words this morning come to us from Jan Richardson with this poem, How the Light Comes. I cannot tell you how the light comes. What I know is that it is more ancient than imagining, that it travels across an astounding expanse to reach us that it loves, searching out what is hidden, what is lost, what is forgotten or in peril or in pain, that it has a fondness for the body, for finding its way toward flesh, for tracing the edges of form, for shining forth through the eye, the hand, the heart. I cannot tell you how the light comes, but that it does that it will, that it works its way into the deepest dark that enfolds you, though it may seem long ages in coming or arrive in a shape you did not foresee. And so may we this day turn ourselves toward it. May we lift our faces to let it find us. May we bend our bodies to follow the arc it makes. May we open and open more and open still to the blessed light that comes. Good morning and Merry Christmas. I hope you have had a wonderful and exciting Christmas morning at your house. This morning, I want us to check in with our bodies. There's so much excitement that happens on Christmas morning that I think it's good if we take just a minute to check in. So maybe you put your hand on your heart Maybe you settle into your chair or stand up and feel your feet on the ground and we'll take a breath in together. And then maybe you notice a sound that is far away. 
see if you can pay attention to something that sounds very far away, maybe a neighbor outside or somebody upstairs. And then come a little closer. Pay attention to what's happening in the room around you. Maybe you can hear the heat, or maybe you can hear somebody breathing next to you. Listen to those sounds. And then come all the way into your body and notice what you feel inside your body. Maybe you feel wiggly or jumpy. Maybe you're ready for this to be over. Maybe you're feeling a little bit tired because you got up so early this morning. Just notice what you feel. And then when you're ready, you can open your eyes. So I wonder what you noticed. I can remember when I was a kid, I would sit on the top of the steps on Christmas morning and I would feel excited about going downstairs, but also feel a little bit nervous. And then I would get downstairs and be filled with wonder that, oh my goodness, there was something exciting for me under the tree. When I feel that awe and wonder, I feel it in my chest. It feels like my heart gets a little bit bigger. And I don't just feel that on Christmas morning. I can feel that when I am out in nature. I can feel that when I'm with people that I love. And that's one of the challenges that we have now. Christmas comes just once a year, but the feelings that we have at Christmas, these feelings of love and joy and wonder, we can carry with us throughout the year. So this might be easy in the summer. In the summer, we could feel joy or awe or wonder when we jump into the pool on a very hot day or we could find a beautiful flower and be just in awe of how wonderful and how tiny and beautiful it is. But what about in like February or March? Can we experience awe and wonder in February or March? I bet you could. Maybe you could find some beautiful ice on the ground and pay attention to the little cracks and patterns. Or maybe you have a particularly delicious cup of hot chocolate. Or maybe you go sledding and you go particularly fast. Or maybe your sibling just does something that is particularly funny and you are filled with feelings of love for your sibling. And then how about October? October comes and we're going back to school and we're already engaged in lots of work already. What could help us to feel awe and wonder in October? I wonder if you could pay attention to the ways the leaves crinkle under your feet or the way a bonfire smells or maybe working really hard on a school project fills your heart with pride. Pretty soon, we'll be back around to Christmas again and filled up with the awe and wonder that we can feel so strongly during this time of year. Wherever you are and however you are spending your day today, I hope you are able to feel a little bit of wonder today and every day of the year.
I invite us into a time of centering with a prayer adapted from a prayer written by the Reverend Anya Samler Michael. Spirit of love, we sit in the glow of ages, wound round stories that teach us some of what it means to be human and some of what it means to be God. The meditations of our hearts and prayers of our souls speak our independent needs loves and yearnings. May they collect for a moment in this our common experience as we direct them together in a spirit of petition. We seek the patience to peer long enough into the eyes of our siblings that we may too see them as children of loving parents and caregivers, children of divinity itself. We seek the wisdom to pause long enough before making judgments that separate us from one another, that separate us from our own souls. We seek the strength to hold the lives that are placed in our care, not to protect them from every trial, no arms are that strong, but to hold them in love as long as love can be found. We seek the still small call to compassion that cannot be silenced, by greed, fear, or anger that roots so deeply in our humanity that it will out should we pause long enough to listen. For all of these, we give of ourselves in prayer or meditation, not to end with an amen, but so we might find the means to make our yearnings manifest in our world by the work of our hands and the proclamation of our hearts. Amen and may it be so.
In those days, a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be registered. This was the first registration and was taken while Quirinius was governor of Syria. All went to their own towns to be registered. Joseph also went from the town of Nazareth in Galilee to Judea to the city of David called Bethlehem because he was descended from the house and family of David. He went to be registered with Mary to whom he was engaged and who was expecting a child. While they were there, the time came for her to deliver her child, and she gave birth to her firstborn son and wrapped him in bands of cloth and laid him in a manger, because there was no place in the guest room. Now in that same region, there were shepherds living in the fields, keeping watch over their flock by night. Then an angel of the Lord stood before them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, do not be afraid, for see, I am bringing you good news of great joy for all the people. To you is born this day in the city of David, a savior who is the Messiah, the Lord. This will be a sign for you. You will find a child wrapped in bands of cloth and lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host praising God and saying, glory to God in the highest heaven and on earth, peace among those whom he favors. I have a stone at my house with the words, holy boldness painted in gold letters. I've had this stone for a few years, and it's spent time in my pocket, in my purse, in a bowl, with other stones hidden in a drawer. It has been scratched and rubbed and held such that now you can hardly make out the words. But I know what it says. Even though it looks like just a smooth stone with a few gold scratches, I know. This is my stone, and it's a reminder to risk bravery, to choose a holy boldness. We just heard the story of the birth of Jesus as it appears in the second chapter of Luke, but I'm going to back us up for just a minute. In the first chapter of Luke, we are introduced to Mary and Joseph when the angel Gabriel comes to young Mary. According to the authors of Luke, Mary was understandably perplexed and almost certainly afraid. I mean, the world was, as it always is, a complicated place. And Mary was a 15-year-old girl living during what was surely a challenging and difficult time. And yet the angel says, do not be afraid. Do not be afraid. I don't know about you, but telling me not to feel whatever it is I'm feeling is a sure way to make me feel more of it. 
Don't be mad escalates my anger. Don't cry hastens my tears. And don't even think about telling me don't freak out. My heartbeat quickens at the mere thought of those words. And yet the angel Gabriel says to Mary, do not be afraid. Maybe some believe that in that moment, Mary's fear vanished. But I imagine Mary thinking something more along the lines of, are you kidding me? Here I am, a girl, unmarried, living in this tumultuous time, and then suddenly an angel comes and tells me that I am to be the mother of this child named Jesus and that he is the Son of God. Of course she was afraid. Of course she was. But in spite of her fear, Mary says yes. Mary says yes, and she sings a song of praise, the Magnificat, not because she is unafraid, but because she is shaken to her core. Mary sings this song of praise because in singing these praises, she is embracing her holy boldness. She is holding her holy fear. She is holding the risk and the uncertainty alongside what is being promised and the future she is being shown. Mary says yes, not because she is ready to hold this risk, but because it is what love is asking her to do. Knowing there may be scandal, knowing she may be ostracized, knowing this doesn't totally make sense and she does not know what will happen, Mary says yes with a holy boldness, ready to choose love. But Mary is not just choosing love and her love of God or her love for the new life she is carrying. In the Magnificat, Mary sings of the strength of her ancestors. She sings of justice and she sings of liberation. She, a poor teenager, sings a song about toppling rulers, feeding the hungry and sending the rich away empty. In her fear, Mary sings of a future she imagines could come into being. Mary listens to what love is calling her to do. And this is a holy risk. This is a bold and holy love. The Magnificat is Mary holding the both and of it all. She is afraid and she is singing. She is uncertain and she has faith. She does not know what will happen and she sings of a future she hopes will become a reality. She sings of the toppling of oppressive systems and she sings of freedom and justice knowing she is risking everything. We know love always comes with a risk, and choosing love means choosing risk every time. And here we are, Christmas Day of 2022, and we too are holding fear, are we not? We too are holding uncertainty. We hold the pain of those oppressive systems still in existence. I'm not here to tell you not to be afraid. To love is to risk. And we are a people whose faith calls us to choose love. Today and every day, we can bring our fear. We can bring our hope. Today and every day, we can bring our hopelessness and our faith, our holy love, our holy fear, holy faith and holy faithlessness, holy hope and holy hopelessness, all of it holy, 
all of us holy. May we live and sing and risk holy love and holy boldness today and every day. Amen. The miracle is not, of course, in the efficacy of the oil, but it is the fire burning in the temple, the fire burning eight days for the people. War, like entropy, is unremarkable, one thing happening over another. But in that day in Kislev, a few people walked into the temple, removed the bloody cloths and the faces of stone, wet some cleaning rags to the task, and using elbows and knees with eyes open, brought a memory of peace back to the old place. They lit the candles one by one. The flame is burning still. One thing I love about being Unitarian Universalist is the freedom to draw from different traditions as we seek to make meaning in a given moment. In this spirit, last Christmas Eve, the reading I chose to support my homily was the poem Peter just read, The Flame is Burning Still. Its message made it an excellent choice for that Christmas Eve service, despite being a poem about Hanukkah written by a Unitarian Universalist minister. I chose this poem as I resonated with Bob Janice Dillon's observation. The story of Hanukkah is a story about God blessing the return to the temple through magically extending the time the lamp oil burned. But as Janice Dillon names, it is also a story about an exhausted and traumatized people finding the will to not only survive, but to reclaim and renew their sacred space. The presence of such resilience in the human heart is nothing short of a miracle. And last Christmas Eve, I was making a similar observation about our own people and frankly about my own self. There we were finally back in our sanctuary, gathering to kindle our candles and to sing of silent nights. After all we had been through, we had it in us to do what we have done, what our parents and grandparents and ancestors had done for many Christmas Eves before. This too was nothing short of a miracle. And if you think about it, I could have used the same poem last night. I notice a new energy and lightness among us in this chapter of our life on earth together, but the spiritual fatigue of the past two 
or four or six years lingers. How can it not? I also resonate with my colleague, Laura Solomon, who affirms in her homily, we too are holding fear. We too are holding uncertainty. We hold the pain of those oppressive systems still in existence. So, mindful of our ongoing resilience amid our weariness and our anxiety, this year I'm inspired to consider a different miracle, the blessing from God changing the laws of science miracle celebrated in the Hanukkah story. For me, part of my Unitarian Universalist identity is hearing ancient stories of miracle as metaphor, real in the way they are vessels of wisdom and meaning, but not real in a literal sense. But at least for this morning, what if we were to imagine experiencing a reality where, as described by Stephen in his reading, angels appear and speak to us? What if we could step into the sand-worn shoes of the Maccabees and their followers and inhabit a world where the holy reveals themselves in a tangible way through the miracle of one day of oil burning for eight? While I may not be ready to say that supernatural miracles exist, I am ready to say that if they do, we have collectively earned at least one. Let's consider the miracle in question. We've all been in situations where we think we're about to run out of something essential. Gas in our car, food in our cupboard, money, time, hope. And somehow our meager supply gets us through. Most parents of young children have earned gold medals in this department, especially in the last few years. I imagine those who remove the bloody cloths, wet some cleaning rags to the task, and using elbows and knees with eyes open, brought a memory of peace back to the old place. I imagine they were relieved, but not surprised when the jar of oil to last one night lasted for two. These things happen. But at some point, the presence of the holy, the miracle of the oil, could not be denied. As the Jews alter the political landscape through their courage and their valor, the way oil burns was also altered by the only one who has the power to do such things. If you were in the presence of divine miracle, what would it mean to you to witness an undeniable blessing of your community and sacred space? How long would you think this miracle could last? Would God companion the Jews and inhabit the temple indefinitely? In the realm of miracles, anything is possible. But we who recognize the holiday of Hanukkah know just how the story ends. The miracle did not last forever. It did not last seven nights or nine. It lasted eight just long enough for those restoring the temple to procure the oil they needed to sustain the flame by their own power. Tonight at sundown, the last night of Hanukkah, the faithful will light eight candles on the menorah in their homes. This ritual will recall the blessing of the temple and through its conclusion will also reenact the beginning of a shift from a time of miracle to a time of familiarity a return to dependence on the simple power of human beings to strive, to endure, to heal, and to grow miracles in their own way. The conclusion of Hanukkah echoes the end of obvious and tangible blessings and the beginning of blessing becoming more of an article of faith. In this moment, we are all nearing the end of our holiday season, our time of wonder, hopefully time set apart from the regular demands of life and, and given instead to rejoicing and reconnection with ourselves and with the ones we love. As we prepare to leave this time of blessing, I invite us to hold fast to the message, be not afraid. As Mary goes forth, empowered despite her vulnerabilities, we go forth with only the simple certainty of our miraculous human possibilities. The word Hanukkah means dedication, referring to the dedication of the temple. In the light of this new day, I invite us to dedicate ourselves to our articles of faith, perhaps faith in a universe holding us in love and strength whenever we have to literally or figuratively repair rubble around us. 
Today is a good day to further dedicate ourselves to that which has allowed us to arrive at this moment. And if we observe companions struggling around us to offer what we can in service to their renewal and the strength of ongoing life. Today is a good day to celebrate that within the human soul, not knowing what comes next, the flame is burning still. Good morning. My name is Liz Ammons. I'm a member of the UU Church in Medford, Massachusetts, where I'm chair of our board, and I'm also co-lead of the neighborhood support team for a family of Afghan refugees. Our church is providing rent-free housing for this refugee family of 10 people, including four children, who fled Kabul in 2021, spent eight months in a refugee camp in Albania and arrived in Medford last April. Volunteers from the church and from the community have been helping the family as they build their new life. The children are at school, the adults are finding jobs, and the health needs of the family are being addressed. But now that it's winter, our church faces the problem of how to pay for heat in the house where the family is living. Our congregation is small and vibrant, but not rich. Paying for the heat, which is predicted to run between six and $8,000, presents a major challenge. We're therefore extremely grateful to the Winchester and Reading churches for committing half of the plate this morning to pay for heat for this refugee family, which seems especially fitting today on Christmas which is also the second to last day of Hanukkah this year and the day before Kwanzaa begins. In Christian tradition, we're asked at this time to remember a family far from home being given shelter by a stranger. In Jewish tradition, we're asked to remember a temple attacked, but the light not going out. In African-American tradition, we are asked to remember the strength of community despite injustice. As we think of others today, especially those in need of shelter, hope, the strength of community, half of our offering will go directly to help pay for heat for this family of refugees from Afghanistan. We hope that you will give as generously as you can. Thank you. Here's how to give. How to give depends on your faith community. For the members and friends of the Unitarian Universalist Church of Reading, Reverend Laura is providing donation information to you directly. For Unitarian Universalists not affiliated with the Winchester Unitarian Society, your congregation has likely already made a donation on your behalf. As always, we encourage you to give generously to your congregation. For members and friends of the Winchester Unitarian Society, the following may sound familiar. You may give checks or may give by electronic donation. For those attending in person, a basket is provided in the Sims room for checks. If you wish to give a check later, you may mail your check to 478 Main Street, Winchester, Massachusetts, 01890. Please refrain from giving cash. For electronic gifts, text the number in your order of service or visit our website under the giving page. Please write or type Christmas Day in the memo line or the comment field. The offering will now be generously given and gratefully received.
The next day is what I mostly like about Christmas, when the wrapping paper and the tinsel and other gay detritus are carefully tucked away, and the happy, excited look in children's eyes is fresh in yesterday's memory, along with the kindly smiles of family and friends and strangers even. 
And I am aware that we have safely navigated the white water of another year with its successes and its sorrows. And our eyes now focus only on the tree with all of its baubles collected over a lifetime hanging quietly and the space beneath it emptied of the brightly colored packages and the tree alone directing us to peaceful paths with its symbolic star. I like the day okay, but the next day is the one I prefer, offering a quiet space, a universal exhalation the day after. When thoughts are gathered up and cast into clear light, I see the suffering world and the dim outline of small things I meant to do. I also hear the laughter and the mixture of the two brings hope that each next day will find us further on.